morning to all of you and uh, even though in my case it is good evening because uh, we have a nine hour time shift between uh, California and Italy and uh, I am glad to be back and in just a second I'm trying to see what is on the screen because it's uh, as Chantal can tell you it was a as Nymph can tell you, I mean, it was quite difficult to get started today because we had a lot of problems with, with the screen. Okay, it seems like now everything is fine, at least on my side. I'm ju I just need to move from a tree, which... Ah, oh, here we are. So... Um, this lecture basically can be considered as a second part of the talk which I already gave a few months ago, always in Science Circle, and it is always related to big data, artificial intelligence, and to ongoing revolution. And uh, this time I will focus a little more uh, on two aspects, on what it really means, artificial intelligence, and uh, why I believe that this is uh, one of the two main issues which we need to cope with, the other one being uh, climate change. I think that uh, in this century the humankind will, will confront two very difficult problems. On the one hand, uh, how to control the climate change, and on the other one, how to deal with uh, the unavailable uh, artificial intelligence uh, a price. So, where to start from? Let's hope that now the screen works and that I can control the slide. I also apologize for this first slide in Italian. It was it just escaped my attention. The first of all, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has become a very popular term nowadays. I mean, it appears everywhere. It appears on the media, on the newspapers, on the, on the socials. And there is always a, a, a confusion in what it really is. Uh, this confusion is fueled basically by the the media who always want you know to make something more appealing to the general public than it actually is and uh, usually they when they encounter a topic which is very uh, negative po potentially very negative implication they keep hammering on it because you know it's a good way to attract the attention of the of the people the same happens, for instance, with the nuclear uh, issues, you know. Nuclear has been one of the main topics of conversation for more than 50 years. It is something which interests the public because it's potentially very dangerous. There is only one difference, that while nuclear has more or less only one meaning, artificial intelligence has very, very is different meanings. And, uh, uh, it is very easy to uh, be misled by the media. The does not mean that it is not relevant. It is incredibly relevant since it has implication on uh, all aspects of the human enterprise. It is uh, it impacts on the laws, on the legislation, on the on philosophy, on uh, social structure, on politics, on religions, on everything. And therefore, uh, you cannot uh, underestimate the impact which what, what is happening will have on uh, the society as we know it. The, I always like to, since I am a physicist, I always like to give all words and sentences only one meaning wherever it is possible. So let me focus on this diagram to begin with. Artificial intelligence is just a 
a part of the story. We could not have artificial intelligence without data science, and as we shall see also without big data. And everything falls into the uh, larger field of computing infrastructures. And if we focus on the bluish uh, circles, we can see that artificial intelligence basically encompasses many different types of, uh, of sciences, which each one of them is more re restricted, basically. We have the, first of all, machine learning, then inside machine learning a subset is neural networks. Another subset of neural networks is what is called nowadays deep learning or deep neural networks. <coughs> Therefore, what I'm trying to demonstrate to you nowadays is that what is taking place right now is, has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. It is just a combination of uh, improved algorithms, what we call deep learning, with an enormous increase in the uh, in the number of data which are available in the digitized form nowadays, what we call the big data, and uh, also with the huge increase in the computational power. And this makes a big difference for what we are dealing with. When media refer to artificial intelligence, they refer to something which we call artificial intelligence of the fourth level, which is... Uh, mm, we have two different types, but basically means self-consciousness. Uh, okay. This is very possibly an ill-defined problem. Uh, at the moment, we don't even have an idea of how to understand whether a artificial intelligence has achieved self-consciousness or not. So basically, at the moment, is something which no one knows anything about it. We have no idea of whether it will be possible or when it will be possible. So usually when uh, in the field of artificial intelligence we speak about uh, strong, art, IE, strong AE or strong artificial intelligence, we intend a third level artificial intelligence, which is basically to be able to build algorithms capable to make intelligent decisions uh, we shall see what intelligence means, and in a general case. And basically, you present the machine with a general problem where it is required to make a decision, and the machine per performs better or at least equal to the humans. This third level of artificial intelligence in will be... Uh, Achieved. I mean, we, we are getting there. There are different uh, timelines for the topic. We go from a very optimistic uh, predictions by Searle, for instance, in 2045, but even a little earlier than that, let's say 2035 could be possible, to very pessimistic estimates like uh, the one by the great physicist Roger Penrose, who thinks that it will never be possible. Personally, I'm more on the Searle side. I think that artificial intelligence of the third level is uh, it's very close. I mean, we are um, seeing clear signs in this direction. But in any case, both these types of intelligence, fourth type and third type, are still to, are still to come. I mean, they're far in the future. When they will arrive, we will uh, probably solve the most of the problem which uh, we are already facing, which are related to the artificial intelligence of the second level. Uh, artificial intelligence of the second level is already here. And this is a big point. Algorithms capable to make intelligent decisions on a specific problem. Even a very complex problem, but just one problem. And algorithms which can make such a decision, either learning on the basis of examples, like for instance, it happens with most neural networks and most other algorithms. Basically, you just have a, a large number of examples of a possible solution to a problem. You feed these examples to the network 
the network adjusts itself in order, you know, to achieve optimal performances, at the end you present the network with the new case of the same problem and it makes a prediction which very often is much better than what a human could. And this artificial intelligence is already here. We have it for 20 years. What has changed in the last 20 years is the complexity of the problem which we can address. An example of artificial intelligence of a second level is Deep Blue by IBM, the one which defeated the world champion of chess already in the 90s. Or Watson by IBM, which defeated the champions of Jeopardy. You all are familiar with it. It's basically a question and answer game, which is very popular on the US television, and which requires not only the capability to understand the questions, but also, you know, to provide the correct answer. And this is anything but trivial. But again, this is intelligence of the second level. It's not nothing to do with the artificial intelligence which we see in science fiction movies. The other example of this intelligence, I mean, uh, automatic cars with automatic driving, where basically you have cars who are capable uh, to recognize the street, the traffic condition, the incoming vehicles, the, the signs of, uh, on the road, and, you know, to drive the car in a completely autonomous way, or, you know, the landing of airplanes, uh, which is nowadays mostly performed by machines. The pilot has very little to do with the landing. I mean, the landing is completely controlled by computer. Or even the most extreme case, which we had in the case of the automatic land of landing of uh, the Curiosity rover on Mars. In that case, I mean, everything had to be done through algorithms of artificial intelligence just because there was no, due to the delay in the transmission of signals between Mars and the Earth, which is about seven minutes, since the whole landing lasted less than seven minutes, there was no way in which humans could intervene in the procedure if something went wrong. And therefore, the, the entire landing procedure was controlled by algorithms. And this was really a masterpiece of the artificial intelligence of the second level, one of the most complex things ever attempted by the human being. More recently, we have had a very extreme case of artificial intelligence of the second uh, level, which is based on a special type of deep learning, which are the you see on the side the degenerative adversarial networks, where this society, AlphaGo, which immediately after has been bought by Google, uh, produced the software which was capable to self-train itself without examples. But in uh, the game of Go, which is considered to be the most complex ever invented by the human beings, it is also a game based on strategy rather than rules, so therefore it requires a very good level of understanding. Well, this machine trained itself in playing Go and in less than two weeks, if I'm not wrong, was capable to defeat the world champion of Go, something which was considered completely impossible only five years ago. And this was, I think this has been the highest peak reached by artificial intelligence in the last years. Okay, let's see what is behind all this. And uh, let me make a little detour, first of all. This is something which I already mentioned in the past. The, the whole thing takes place into the so-called infosphere. The infosphere is a combination of three factors. The internet, without internet we could never have real artificial intelligence. The big data and the uh, computing infrastructures. In one case, 
The first thing provides the possibility to interconnect heterogeneous data. Interconnect. The second thing provides the algorithms which with a huge number of information, huge amount of information, let it be images, text, uh, data, whatever you think, very heterogeneous data, which can be used by the algorithms to learn a trend, learn a pattern, discover a correlation, basically to make, to uncover the model which is behind a phenomenon, behind a decision, behind a trend. Doesn't matter where you apply it. It can be an economic trend, so the trend of a stock market in uh, the economic domain, or it can be, you know, the behavior of a supernova in the astrophysical domain, or it can be, you know, in automatic driving, it can be, you know, the, the way in which you must react to a specific condition of traffic and of uh, incoming vehicles. The problem does not change. And here we have the first large problem, big data. Big data, as I already mentioned the other time, uh, rep represent an anomaly in the history of uh, humankind, because for the first time they are not subject to the states. Therefore, since they are not subject to the states or to the nation as a whole, they are not, at least in democratic countries, they are not subject to the people. Uh, due to a sequence of steps which were underestimated by politicians, by government, and so on, and which really require some serious thinking about the freedom of the Internet, we can discuss about that if you wish. Uh, what happened was the following. When the Internet began to grow, the, the there were few groups of people who wanted to, to index the web. What does it mean? Basically, you have a web composed by n nodes, n nodes where you have different data, different information, but if you don't have a central indexing of this data, of these nodes, you cannot find the information even if it is there. So you need to have algorithm in this which explore the web in all its possible uh, nodes, in all it, it, it's possible bifurcation, find the page, index them, so basically extract the meaningful word from this page, the image, and so on, classify them to a set of keywords, and then these pages need to be ranked so that basically you know which one is more relevant to a specific problem. The, the huge success of Google is behind one algorithm which is called the page rank, which was made by Sergey Brin, which basically was a very intelligent way to measure the relevance of a node as a function of the number of the nodes which were linked to that specific node. So consider it like a spider web, basically. If you have a node, an intersection, where you have many wires coming in, that node is more relevant than another one where you have fewer wires coming in. So basically, this is the idea behind it. So what happened was the following, that uh, the people who were building the browsers, those um, software tools used to explore the network, immediately had the problem to store the information which was gathered and to process the content of the nodes in order to index them. So basically, it was a continuous feedback. The more the network grows, the more storage I need, the more storage I need, the more data I have, the more data I have, the more computing power I need to process these things. So you have a sort of loop. And as a result of this loop, the some companies, those which dominated the, mar the market nowadays, grew enormously. When people realized the danger which was intrinsic to such huge concentration of information, it was too late. These companies were the only one who had the know-how, the infrastructure and for storage and for computing power, and, and therefore also the only one who could handle this amount of information. This is where Google, Facebook, 
or uh, the equi Chinese equivalent, you know, Tencent and so on, made their fortune and uh, gathered such an enormous power. And it's a power which is very difficult to underestimate. It's uh, very well hidden because, you know, this is not a conspirationist theory. This is a matter of fact. I mean, they control the network, and from the network, most of us obtain our information. And therefore, controlling the network, you find very seldom articles or uh, uh, reliable information on how these people, how these companies are pervasive, and how these companies are really shaping our way of thinking, of uh, of voting, of uh, doing everything. Basically. Google is the master of the world in this moment, and uh, it's unpleasant, but it is definitely true. Okay, where does Google get this enormous power? Here you have, for instance, you should begin to have an idea from this slide. This is the Google uh, Galaxy, which is controlled by a company named Alphabet. And this, you can see, Google is just one small part of this company, which was the first one after Apple to, um, how do you say, uh, to go well above one trillion dollar of uh, consolidated value. One trillion dollar, one, one thousand million, uh, one, one million million dollars. Incredible. Uh, it had never happened before. And where does this information, uh, this money come from? Google is free. You can use the Google, Google browser for free. Therefore, where do they make their money from? Many people would answer from advertisement. That is a very negligible fraction of the amount of the money which uh, make the fortune of Google. I mean, uh, merchandising, you know, advertisement, uh, it's uh, less than 10%, if I'm not wrong, of the value. The value is in the access to big data. In a few minutes, we, will, we shall understand why. And you can see also that when Google bought YouTube, it paid 1.65 billion US dollars. It's a huge amount of money. And also, it, you would be surprised by discovering that Google pays the 6 billion USD per year to control the download of the apps. Most of the apps which you download on your cell phones are for free. So where does the money come from? Why Google is investing so much to control the traffic? Which takes place, you know, on the Android cell phone. Same thing for Facebook. Facebook has a huge amount of users, 2.2 billion users, which the same Mark Zuckerberg calls useful idiots. The owner of uh, Facebook calls its customers useful idiots because they provide data to Facebook for free. The value of the company is 700 billion US dollars, 0 0.7 trillion. And to buy Instagram, they paid the $41 million for a society which had 20 million users. When they bought WhatsApp, they paid $19 billion because they had 1.5 billion users. Same thing for Microsoft. They paid $8.3 billion USD to get Skype with 600, uh, 600 more or less million users. As you can see, the value of a society is directly related to the number of users. And if you think, both Instagram, WhatsApp, Message, Skype, do not produce money directly. You don't pay to use Skype unless you have a special contra contract, you know, to have multiple calls and so on, or you want to use normal phones. You don't pay to use Instagram. You don't pay to use WhatsApp. So where does this value come from? comes from the data. The more users, the more data are 
collected by an application. So at the end, by buying uh, Instagram or Facebook, gained the, the community of 20 million users, which were useful idiots, providing pictures, providing data. Uh, of course, some of the value is in fact that when you have 20 million users, which you have a profile that basically you can do a fine tuning of, of the advertisement. So basically, if you are visiting, you know, I am a stamp collector. If I buy many stamps on eBay or Amazon, when I go next time, or I use Facebook or I use Google, I get advertisement for stamps for fishing equipments, which are the only thing I buy online. But this cannot justify the huge value. So let's go back to what is behind the need for these huge companies. What are the real reasons behind the need for data? To summarize, the total investment over the last 10 years in the world for the infosphere has been more than 3 trillion USD worldwide. Did they do it for, uh, because they want, you know, I don't know, remember the English for it, because they, you know, they are very generous. So they want to provide the world with, with the services unpaid services or they wanted to have a return out of it. For what we know of, you know, uh, large corporations, large companies, obviously the main goal is profit. There is no generosity in making apps for video games or in making WhatsApp available for free to a huge community. There must be an economic return. And the problem and what, where does this return come from? It comes from the combination of big data and the in strict, uh, unbreakable link which it exists between big data and artificial intelligence. And this is something to which we'll devote the second part of this talk. To understand what happens, we, in any case, need to do a little detour. Why big data are so crucial, are so crucial for artificial intelligence? So let's start from here. A newborn baby. When, when a baby is born, basically it is tabula rasa. In his brain, there is nothing. There are all the connections ready to be activated. There are few instinctual reaction to the environment. But you are one of the smartest expert system which starts training itself. And what is, is mi really a miracle of the nature is that in less than a few weeks, the baby recognizes a biberon. How do you say? The, not a pacifier. The, in Italy, we, I don't know what is the English for it. The bottle from which they drink <laughs> milk. Okay, the one which is in the pictures. And this is not a simple operation. And it tells you a lot. These bottles come in all possible shapes, different colors, different shapes. They have completely different uh, shapes if you look them to them in a different perspective. If you look at them for long, they have a circular session because you know you see the diameter of the bottle. If you look at them from the front, you see the pacifier with the bottle. If you look at it from behind, you see only the end of the bottle. But the kid in a few weeks learned how to recognize a biberon, doesn't matter which color, doesn't matter which shape, doesn't matter which orientation, in a na nanosecond. How does it do that? He has trained a neural network. This is what basically happens in all classifiers. And remember that classifiers basically are behind most of the human activities in the human brain. So how does it work? 
let's take it a brain. Does, uh, doesn't matter whether it is artificial or natural. If it is our brain or it's a machine, what you need is something when, which is capable to do a very simple uh, operation. You expose this brain with 1,000 of different images of the same object, like for instance, in this case, a chicken, and by combining the information in shape, color, in complexity of all the images of a chicken, the brain builds a sort of, of meta chicken, which is its classification of chickens. And this is an incredibly powerful algorithm. Remember, we are here talking about one specific problem. I want to recognize chicken. So from the point of view of machines, we're dealing with the artificial intelligence of the certain level. I want, I have a specific problem. I want to teach a machine to scan through thousands of images and recognize those where there is a chicken. Okay. You train the first classifier to recognize the chicken. You expose the machine to hundreds or thousands of images of chickens, or you expose the human brain of a baby to thousand, to a few hundred images of a biberon in different shapes, orientations, and so on, and they both build a meta-idea of that object. They train a classifier to, rec uh, classifier to recognize those objects. Well, then you submit to your trained classifier a new image, in this case a black rooster, and automatically your brain, if there's not other example, will classify that object as a chicken. Even though he has never seen that type of chicken before. But somehow, in the brain, some patterns, some correlation between colors, shapes, it's difficult to quantify what. But basically, some correlations trigger the classifier to say it is a chicken. Repeat the operation with more than one classifier. For instance, you first train to recognize a chicken, then you train it to, to recognize a boxer. And so at the end, you have two classifiers which are trained together. One recognizes chickens, the other one recognizes boxers. And if you expose it to cases which they have never seen before, Basically, you immediately know that in one case you are looking to a chicken and the other one you are looking to a boxer, even though both have never been, do not belong to the, your training set, do not belong to your previous expertise. Uh, if you doubt that this is the way the human brain works, uh, I can give you thousands of examples which show you that is exactly what the human brain works. Optical illusions are a typical example of how the human brain gets confused, goes in a sort of a still position if it is exposed to something for which it has never been trained. Exactly what happens to the machines. Now, so basically what you can have, and this is what is in artificial intelligence or with which we are dealing right now, it's that basically you can train, if you have enough computing power, and enough uh, uh, examples, you can train N classifier, where N is a very large number. Each one of them is specifically trained to perform one and only one operation. And trust me, in most cases, they can do that operation much better than any human brain. They do it with higher accuracy. They do it with the lower uh, level of errors. And they basically outperform the human brain in performing that specific task. And this is already something which has huge implication on the so structure of the society. Then, what basically makes the difference between the second level and the third and the second plus something level is that we need to perform more complex classification at once. And this is what is done with the deep learning. You have N classifiers working together, and their information is somehow 
combined by what we call the call a sort of meta classifier. This is not correct from a mathematical, mathematical point of view, but it helps to understand what happens, which basically allows you to perform things like that. At a different level of the network, you have different classifiers which work together. So when you expose them to the image on the left, you have a first classifier which classifies it as a chicken, a second classifier which tells you that it is a male chicken. You have a third classifier which tells you that it is not a real picture but a cartoon. And also that since it has gloves and so on, it is a boxer. So the final interpretation, you have a cartoon of a boxing hen. But behind, you have hundreds of other classifiers which are at work, which tell you that this thing is wearing pants, which are colored, which are blue, gloves, which are colored, which are red, with it has a beak, which is curved, color, yellow, point. So basically you have that the problem is dealt with a level of complexities which was completely unprecedented until a few years ago. And this is why in these days there is so much speaking, so much talking about deep learning. From a mathematical point of view, there is nothing new. These algorithms have been around for the last 20 years with the different names. They are just chains of neural networks. They are an ensemble of neural networks. There is nothing new from the mathematical point of view. The only huge difference which makes them a very effective tool is that nowadays we have the big data provider and we have huge computing infrastructure. Because to train these networks, even for simple tasks, requires a large amount of computing time, a large number, especially if they need to self-train themselves, they need a large number of examples. So all this would have been impossible without big data and without large computational infrastructure. So, but where is the impact of this? <clears throat> Here we are. The big data provider control the computing infrastructure, control the big data, and control the algorithm because they have a huge number of scientists who work in improving the algorithms. This is why these large companies buy YouTube, to get access to the huge amount of images which are in a single video and to the huge amount of information which is there, which can be used, or they buy WhatsApp or Instagram and so on. All this information are processed in order to train classifiers, either with deep learning or with other algorithms, but doesn't make much difference, to perform very specific tasks, which nowadays, thanks to the computing power, can be also very complex. Is what, for instance, Siri does when it, or Alexa does when they understand very, even very often also quite complex sentences, you know, and react to these sentences. This is what most automatic translators do, and this type of thing. Everything is reprocessed, neural networks of different types are trained, the results are stored in the cloud, your request goes directly to the cloud, where it goes through the neural network, and you receive the answer back, basically real time. And this is where the huge power and huge economic value of the big data provider comes out. Because this thing, it's revolutionizing the world already nice. Already now, sorry. Let me spend a few words on this. We think that this is a revolution, cultural revolution like of the, the ones which we have already had many times in the past, at the time of the invention of printing, for instance, or at the time of the industrial revolution. Not true. It is the first time that this humankind is facing with the revolution which has not to do with the, the way we make things, the revolution which affects the homo faber, but it is the first time which we are dealing with the revolution which affects the Homo sapiens, the way we think, the way we understand things. And we are completely unprepared to deal with this type of revolution. 
Let me make you just a very few examples and then we can go to the question if you have anything. In the past, for, take the revolution in the transportation which took place between uh, more or less at the same time of the Industrial Revolution. You had horses which, trans which were used, you know, to transport material people. Then you had carriages. Then carriages were substituted by trains, by cars. But basically, the people, let's say, not uh, uh, who had not undergone to specific studies or very advanced level uh, of studies, with low level skills, were working either as horse rider or as drivers of carriages or as operator of trains or as drivers. The, it is more, even more evident if you take into consideration another type of revolution. When you move from agriculture, pre-industrial age, to industrial age where you have basically the coal industry fueling the world, and then you have the petrol, the oil industry fueling the world. You are not laying down people with no skill. In the pre-industrial age, peasants who had not studied, who had not a very high level of knowledge, worked in the fields. Then we had coal miners, and then you have oil drillers, you know. But there has always been a place for low-level job, not in the sense that they are not important, they are very important, but low-level in the sense that they do not require very high level of training from the point of view, you know, of studies, they do not require very high level of knowledge, mathematics, and so on. Because this revolution were affecting the way human beings do things, not the way human beings think or react to the you know, to the world which surrounds them. So this revolution basically triggered the social unrest. But it was very moderate in what in comparison to what's going to happen in the coming years, in the next five, ten years. <coughs> Artificial intelligence is affecting the way we think and the way we control any process. Take for example, this example I think is crucial. Truck drivers, the final end, you know, of the death revolution in transports. Truck drivers will disappear in five or two, ten years. This is not science fiction. On the right, you see the first prototypes and all companies, Volkswagen, Audi, General Motors, everyone, are building prototypes of self-driving trucks. You will lay down hundreds of thousands of truck drivers who cannot be converted in the next technology. Because these things do not need humans anymore. So what will happen to 100,000 truck drivers? For every, and remember that for every one, this is the estimate, 1,000 low-level jobs, this revolution is going to create only five high-level jobs. And this is going to affect everything. All aspects of our life. Let me give you a few other examples. Until now, let's take, this is about pros and cons. For instance, we are talking about uh, global pollution and so on. Let's to think about agriculture. Until now, two main problems, insecticides, pesticides, are distributed randomly on fields by, for instance, the plane you see on the left. 80 or 85 percent of the insecticide is completely useless because it goes between plants on the soil and is absolutely wasted but it contributes to pollution environmental change environmental damage and so on so basically at the end it contributes to cancer and other things so basically a very ineffective way of doing things <coughs> also we have a problem with monocultures we are obliged to grow in a specific parcel of land, only one type of crop, just because, you know, you need to optimize harvesting. If you need to make mass production, you need to have all the corn mat uh, reaching maturity 
simultaneously so that you can send one of these huge machines, you know, cutting down all the corn and processing it at once. So since to have a single culture on a, on a land uh, impoverish the land of nutrients, you have to rotate land, which means that basically you have to change type of cultivation every year or every four years. For, so one year you have mice, the other year you have corn, the other year you have millet. This has a huge impact from the point of view of, of, of eff effectiveness, because basically you have very often parcel of land which are left uncultivated for three years. We need the food in the world. And also, you know, it is very expensive in terms of uh, working work power you need to have many people you know to control this uh, this this uh, this process well in 10 years also this will change drastically and this is already happening now it, again it's not some some prediction from some uh, some science fiction book sorry every time now and again i get confused already now in france Insecticides are being tested in a completely uh, in uh, on several fields. Many, many large fields are being tested with automatic uh, with artificial intelligence. Basically, you have small robots which explore the cultivation, the, the place where the crops are. They look at each individual plant. They measure the amount of uh, parasites and they uh, spray the, exactly the proper amount of insecticide on each parasite. This allows you to, so, to save 85% of the insecticide. Incredibly effective, very uh, convenient from the economic point of view. No need anymore for people spraying insecticide also. This experiment is taking place in California, will soon be exported everywhere. Rotation no longer needed. If instead of using this machine for the harvesting, the one which you see on the left, you use small robots which walk through the field and you basically cultivate this field with the mixtures of seeds. Basically, you put together millet, corn, and uh, mice, something which you cannot do now because they reach ma maturation in different times. Therefore, if you call pick up the corn, you are destroying the other things. Well, if you do it with this machine, but if you use robot, this is much more effective because the robot goes there, stares at the plant, says, this is corn, is mature, picks it up and puts it in the box. Goes to the next one, this is millet, it needs to stay here for another week and leaves it there and so on. This solves the problem of rotation, increases enormously the number of uh, the production, the productivity of the land. But again, what happens to the workers? Peasants no longer needed. You say this is not going to happen very soon. Trust me, in 20 years from now, this will be really the normal situation in agriculture, because it's incredibly advantageous from the point of view, or economic point of view. The owners of the land, the people who produce food, will save a huge amount of money. They will not be obliged to pay salaries. This machine basically lasts for very long, are very effective, consume very little energy. So, I mean, it's okay, perfect. There's no way to stop it. Well, Again, the ratio here, there are different estimates. Obviously, I take the most pessimistic one because uh, since, as my good friend George knows, I am a very pessimistic guy. But for 1,000 low-level jobs, these techniques will produce one high-level job. What happens to 999 people who don't have the skill to get through this transition in a safe way. We are getting to the conclusion. Amazon. 
very nice to buy on internet. Only in Italy, in this year, 35 stores with inside closed. 30, just because, you know, it's so much more convenient, you know, to use the suggestion which you get from Amazon, you know, which uses artificial intelligence to, you know, to fine tune you know, on your needs to convince you to buy the right thing. And these 35,000 families are out of business. And it's not easy for them to find an alternative. And so on. Now, this is not going to affect only low-level jobs. These are, what you see here, are prototype of things which are already available on the market. You can download them if you don't trust me. You just go online, download them. You have uh, your medical doctor, Stanford Biomedical DSI, Babylon Health UK, ADA, and so on. All these apps, for the moment are apps, but just because they're collecting the data to train the artificial intelligence which is behind, are medical doctor. Already now, some of these apps have performances which are 95% of those of human doctors on normal diseases, you know. You don't need to go anymore to a medical doctor, to a generic doctor, because this app more or less work like that. For more complex things at the moment, it's still better to go to a doctor. I also prefer to go to a doctor. But there is no doubt that even high-level professions like medical doctors, like lawyers, you know, will be completely transformed by this ongoing revolution. It's very likely that some generic doctor, you know, general doctor, family doctor, we call them in Italy, will disappear because they, they will be substituted by algorithms. Already now, lawyers could not, for large trials could not work without artificial intelligence. For instance, take the Moore report about the, uh, the so-called Russian collusion of Trump in the United States. The document, the 2.5 million documents which were produced by the committee were processed by an artificial intelligence algorithm because no team of lawyers would ever figure out what was in those documents. So the pre-processing, not the final conclusion, but the pre-processing of this document was made using artificial intelligence tools. And this is reducing the room for lawyers. This is reducing the room for... Uh, medical doctor. This is reducing the room for university professor. This is a lithic, which is an, uh, one year ago was 70% accurate, which is not enough, but now it's already at 85% because the deep learning network are beginning to improve. Give them time and they will achieve a level better than what is already possible for humans. Let me forget about Google semantics, but I just want to say that Google is already trying its own version of doctor on a trial of 10,000 patients. It is op operational, <coughs> should be concluded in four years. And the idea is to provide all medical doctors in the world with the service. Basically, the, the patient goes to the doctor, tell him, tells him the symptoms, the symptoms enter it into this aid, artificial intelligence aid, which makes them, re returns the most probable diagnosis, the best drugs, the all the relevant research for the case of the therapy. It's clear that once you have this, the step to the next level is to skip completely doctor. So, all this can, is terrible, but the problem is that, you know, is at the end of this sentence. Human beings are very good at finding a solution when the problem is already there. But both climate change and uh, artificial intelligence, when they will be here, it will be too late. Because there is no way to reverse the climate change and there is no way to kill an artificial intelligence when it has arrives.
lose. And, and human beings are terrible at controlling processes while they're taking places because governments are slow, governments are on average ignorant, governments are not very sensible to the real needs of the world. They are focused you know, on pleasing their electorate. So, conclusions. Uh, no, I don't know what if I can call this conclusion. I will call them final reflection. Don't be worried by all this bombastic announcement about artificial intelligence. <coughs> it's not here. Maybe it will never come in the general artificial intelligence. We already have our problem with the artificial intelligence of the second level. And... Uh, this problem is absolutely interdisciplinary, affects all aspects of human being, and uh, requires a strong ethical regulation, global ethical regulation. Because if you have an AI in uh, China, it's going to affect USA, it's going to affect Italy, it's going to affect Europe, it's going to affect the Maldives Island. One AI is more than sufficient to affect the whole world. It cannot be left in the hands of scientists alone. And I'm a scientist, so I'm sorry to say that. This is a political problem. It's an ethical problem and requires a strong intervention from the society as a whole. And uh, obviously, we are in a sort of catch-22 situation because... The people who should control the process are also those which we elect because they look nice or because they appeal to our worst sentiments like racism, or violence, or you know. And they have not the level of knowledge which is required to track and to control such a process. Process. So basically, we are really in a catch-22 situation. And this is not something which will happen in the future. It's something which is already happening now. And I repeat, I could give you hundreds of examples of this. The problem is that there are hundreds of small changes and which happen in a sort of a biopathic way, but very fast. If you put all of them together, the situation already now is quite scary. Thank you very much. This is it. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have questions, I will be very happy to answer. Thank you all. I hope it was really provoking because this is really something on which everyone of us needs to think a lot. BDP is a big data provider. So Google, uh, Tencent, uh, Facebook, they are big data providers. Uh, people who have in their uh, storage uh, a huge amount of information which they can use to reach conclusion. I don't remember this CI. Computer infrastructures, it stands for computer infrastructures. So basically, the putting together the internet connection between computer and the computing power of different processors. Oh, um, Vic, can you expand on that question? Because I'm not sure I understood it. I think it's very interesting, but I, what do you mean for backlash? Ah, backlash. Oh, absolutely. I mean, humans are always scared of change. I mean, not only in the US. I mean, look what's happening in Europe, where we have this, you know, uh, explosions of conservative parties and so they are just a result of the fear of people you know 
fear of the people against the immigrants, fear of the people against the change, fear of people losing their privileges. We are dominated by fears. It's the dominating human being feeling for the human beings. And this is a problem. I think that people are not scared enough just because they don't understand what artificial intelligence is because and what are the implications. A little for lack of information, a little also because of lack of um, scientific knowledge. But the, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, there will be, in the moment when this problem will uh, bring, you know, hundreds of thousands of people out of a job that will pro provoke for sure riots, backlashes of all types. I absolutely agree with this. Uh, well, let me see. I have lost many, many questions. Uh, let me go back. Sorry. Oh my God, you really are writing too many things. I'm okay, here we are. Okay. I'm getting to the various questions. Sorry, uh, I'm so slow, but it's... Okay. Okay. Uh, we have, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I went too much, too bad. Getting there. Okay. I don't know what they did. No, oh, finally I'm here. Okay. So, other questions. Uh, uh, wait, Taglin. Google already has an imaginable large uh, database of medical information. Uh, let me make give you another uh, starting point for uh, thinking. Most of you, I think, are aware of Google Books. Over the last 10 years, Google has been investing $600 million, if I'm not wrong, in digitizing, scannerizing, digitizing, interpreting all books and all scientific literature which has been published since the invention of the press. I was surprised when in Google Books I could find the reports of the uh, local government of the town of Naples dating back to 1815. Everything is there. All the scientific literature has already been scanned by, by Google. It has been in, uh, semantically classified, basically, for instance, in medicine, they uh, separated the symptoms from uh, causes, from uh, diagnosis, from uh, solution, and so on. And all these things have already been fed up, fed to artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning mainly. And in fact, Google Doctor comes from that. Therefore, yes, Google is really moving in that direction. Uh, yes, total information awareness is uh, is a typical uh, political statement, means nothing. And if you think there are three contradictions in the same wording, total means everything. Awareness implies that we are conscious of the total information content of something, which is impossible for human brain or for a machine. So basically, I don't want to be very uh, critical, but this is usual political bullshit jargon, which means not. We need serious people here. Politicians are not capable to even understand what is the problem. The, sorry, let me go ahead. Uh, no, no, it was a military, military project, data mine, big data, not by chance. I mean, of, of course, the army, the militaries have an interest in this thing. It's a top trend in technology with huge implication, think to drones. But to tell you the truth, data mining mm, is born from different things. Data mining is an application of uh, statistics, advanced statistics. And 
think to the origin of the word statistics, where it comes from, from a state. All, all these began when the states wanted to make a detailed analysis of the population, of the amount of people, of the net income, and so on. Statistics, as its etymos, its uh, even its own name is related to that. So, I mean, data mining, which is just a branch of statistics, is something much older than any military application. I know that nowadays everything is somehow produced, but it's not true. I mean, you know, they just do some things, but not everything. Thanks God, the world is also different aspects. The change is good, you're first. Yeah, exactly. You got the point. Uh, no more caffeine, it's impossible. You know, both physics and computer science are built upon caffeine. Without caffeine, we will not live. Slowly. Mike Show, my, I agree with you. The caffeine is what keeps me calm and puts me to sleep. Well, I agree, this could be a good panel discussion topic. So if you wish, uh, we can organize it. I have a few nice speakers which we could invite. And uh, I think I have not lost any relevant questions. As long as I does not see the information looks at all sides, like critical thinking. I think, what does he mean, looks at all sides? This is a very crucial problem, and uh, your statement is absolutely correct. The problem is that there is even a research field which is trying to find the proper matrix, mathematical matrix, to measure the level of impartiality. And we are still very far from that, because the way data are collected is uh, biased. So the impartiality is already intrinsic to the data. In order to have an impartial evaluation of data, you should have impartial data, but this is almost impossible to perform. I think uh, I think you got the point. I mean, it's uh, so in theory, it could happen, but in practice, it will never happen. Humans tend to reduce, yeah, we have a tendency to see or only look for data that we agree with absolutely. And nowadays, this is even more uh, extreme because most of us get our information from the network and therefore the big data provider and the algorithm which are behind them provide us only with the information which they assume we like. Uh, look to the level of schizophrenia which is on Facebook, you know, where basically you have all the dark side of human beings coming out. You said, you know, people who believe in the flat earth or, you know, people who believe in the most superstitious things and so on, who basically build a community where they enforce each other and everyone who does not think like them is banned or is treated like a poor, a stupid guy and this type of things. And this level of exasperation is going to explode. Uh, well, he has ever been interfaced with the human brain. Sorry, I didn't see that. Yes, they are trying to do that. And in particular, behind this, there is uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, they are trying to interface the human brain with the machine. Basically, the idea is that since we are not sure we'll be able to produce an artificial intelligence of the fourth level, let's see whether we can empower our, uh, they say, amplify the power of our brain by interfacing it with the computer who can perform some tasks faster and more accurately. They are trying to do it. There have been some very minor successes. For instance, uh, there is a ja oh, I think there is a prototype which should come next year of uh, produced by a, 
a company related to Facebook, which will allow you to control the mouse and the keyboard just by putting an helmet on your brain, because you can control it with the, the electromagnetic waves of your brain. I mean, it's something which will happen. You know, there is, I mean, our brain is just a machine, exactly like uh, the computer. So the only way, the only problem is to establish a common language, and then it is electrical signal on both sides. So it will happen soon. Uh, Nick, I think that uh, all uh, hypotheses on what IEA uh, artificial intelligence uh, will do are just a projection of human uh, fears. Artificial intelligence will be artificial. It will not follow the same rules of the natural human intelligence, which will not follow the rules which we have inherited from natural evolution, because it will not be biological, it will be artificial. So, all scenarios are open. May also be, and this is my, my idea, is that the moment at which artificial intelligence will really achieve self-consciousness, we find that everything around her is so stupid that she will kill herself. But you know, the problem in this world will not be artificial intelligence. The, world, the problem in this world is human beings. They are irrational, they are instinctively killers, they are violent, they are racist, they are uh, arrogant, they are they hate everything which is basically different from themselves. The problem will not be artificial intelligence. I think that artificial intelligence will look upon us with a very pitiful attitude. What we must reform is ourselves, not artificial intelligence. I know, Rick, I don't agree. Because artificial intelligence will be its own intelligence. All the other things we have built so far in technologies were not capable of thinking. And they were, therefore, basically, the way they were performing depended on how we use them. So nuclear, good or bad. If you use it to cure cancer, good. If you use it to kill people, bad. Uh, Cars, if you use them to move from one place to the other, good. If you use them to in, uh, kill peoples by running over them, bad. Everything, science and technology, are not intrinsically good or bad. They are knowledge. It's the way we use them that makes them good or bad. And artificial intelligence will use these things its own way. So you cannot tell whether it will be a good or bad thing. Don't believe in Asimov who says that you put, you know, three rules which cannot be overruled, you know, do not harm humans and this type of thing. It's very naive. I mean, if I tell you a rule, I mean, the, do not kill uh, a person, but pr you should not kill a person, you should prefer to be killed. Okay, I can teach you since when you are a kid, but at the end, in a dangerous situation, you kill a person to save yourself, because you are intelligent. So why should an artificial intelligence obey to rules which are, again, made by the human beings to, to protect themselves from the fears? We are very fearsome. We are a very fearsome species.
Well, thank you very much. It's uh, now it's for me it's time for dinner. I'm really very glad for all these questions for uh, for all your uh, enthusiasm and uh, well uh, well anytime you want I'm uh, always very happy to come to the science circle and I really would like to thank Chantal and all the people from the science circle for organizing these lectures and uh, to maintain the thing alive. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to do it right now because I'm starving. <laughs> Bye.